all for taking our comments. Hi, I'm Jerry. My name is uh, Tim Thomas. <coughs> I'm a professor at Brown University and the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. And that, is that Tim N? T I M N O N S. Yeah. Okay. It's John Timmons Roberts, if you want to. Um, I am uh, not speaking in my institutional capacity. I am not paid to do all this work commenting on these. Um, on these proposals. I also uh, submitted testimony uh, through the Conservation Law Foundation, uh, which is a longer version. It's actually pretty different um, back in February um, through the, uh, to the Energy Facility Standing Board. Um, so there's a lot to talk about, but I guess I would say um, that I'm very happy to see one hearing or event just about climate change because it's getting a bit less attention, but it's really the long term. Uh, whatever, all the issues are important. The local ones in Burrillville are extremely important, but this is really for everybody. Um, and I think the participatory process that you all have set up is is uh, is critical, and really, it's going to have a huge impact on the level of cynicism or belief in our government uh, how this decision is handled, and that is, if the uh, people making the decision are given the real um, latitude to, to judge based on the evidence that's brought. So um, I, I can talk about three things. So the first one is sort of the, um, the Resilient Rhode Island Act and why it matters. So we heard before that the targets are 10% emissions reductions by 2020 from a 1990 baseline, 45% uh, by 2035 and 80% by 2050. That was a major achievement a big deal for the state of Rhode Island to take that step. We were, in fact, though, that was in 2014, signed into law, but passed almost uh, unanimously in the Rhode Island House, passed unanimously in the Senate, and it was based on production-based, that is, generation-based uh, accounting. Actually, in the hearing in the Senate committee, mentioned consumption-based uh, accounting and said that might be better, but it's not the basis of the law. It's based on generation-based accounting. Um, and the agreement for the, um, the study that's going on right now, um, you know, by Nescount, the consultant, and the Stockholm Environmental Institute, is using consumption-based accounting. But that's, uh, that was just sort of agreed for that study. It's not really part of our statute in the state, and it's not, I think, uh, more generally agreed. Um, so I have some more things. I have a whole section here about accounting. I submitted these comments uh, electronically last night, um, and I have one copy that I'll give. Um, I, I like consumption-based accounting in general, but it's not really the law of the land. And I think it's problematic to switch at this point after we've agreed targets uh, to a different accounting system. Uh, it also creates the problem that we just heard about of uh, Rhode Island, in fact, um, you know, being the site of a lot of the emissions reductions, in fact, um, I'm sorry, the, the increased emissions that are then flowing, uh, the energy flowing directly to Massachusetts and Connecticut. And you can see in some of the graphs we saw earlier how Massachusetts is reducing its emissions pretty quickly. Um, and it's going to be impossible for us under the, um, with this uh, major project to meet our, those targets that I discussed. So at the level of production that's, that's in the Clean Air Act operating permit application from Invenergy uh, to the DEM to run its turbines for 30 days a year on fuel oil at 1,200 ton, uh, pounds of CO2 Let's per megawatt hour. Hold on. To okay. run its turbines for 30 days a year. On fuel oil. And that's at 1,227 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour and natural gas for the rest of the year, which is at three, 781 pounds per, per megawatt hour. At this level, the plant would generate uh, about 3.4 3 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. And if we are a little more generous and say, well, they might actually run it less than that, that's just their permit application, we're still at about 3.4 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. That's about, if almost 7 billion pounds of uh, CO2 per year. If it's lasting for the 40 years that this is expected to um, operate, that's 280 billion pounds of carbon dioxide. 
my calculation is that um, our emissions at our 1990 baseline that's in the Rosalind Rhode Island Act was about 11 and a half million metric tons. Converting that to short tons or American tons, that's about uh, 10.3 uh, American US tons. So if it emits about three and a half million tons on top of our, and right now we're, we're close to where we were in 1990. So this is about a 30% increase, as I understand this, unless I'm getting this math very wrong, increase in the, in the state's overall emissions. So it's huge, and I think it will make it impossible for the state to meet its targets. In the short term especially, we have targets for 2020. That would require, and we're supposed to be 10% below 1990 by 2020. That would require us to reduce our emissions by 10% a year, practically, in the next four years which I'm game for, but I'm be very uh, hopeful that the, uh, the state agencies and so on would do so. It's going to be extremely hard to meet these goals, Thank and it's going to be possible. You time. So one last thing, um, I'll wrap up with this. The Resilient Rhode Island Act is aspirational, but it's the public policy of the state. It's the only policy we have on climate change. It represents prudent policy for the orderly transition we have to make. Uh, in fact, I argue in here that it's it's not strong enough that we should be reducing our emissions almost to zero by 2030. Uh, and then I have evidence in here that shows, for example, an Oxford study showing that we globally should not be building any new fossil fuel facilities after 2017 if we're going to stay under two degrees of warming. Finally, there's one section of the Resilient Rhode Island Act. It's 42-6.2-8. It states that state agencies must act in accordance with the law. And that law is that consideration of the impacts of climate change shall be deemed to be within the powers and duties of all state departments, agencies, commissions, councils, and instrumentalities, including quasi-public agencies. And each shall be deemed to have and to exercise among its purpose in the exercise of, of its ex existing authority the purposes set forth in this chapter, that is the Resilient Rhode Island Act, persistent, pertaining to climate change mitigation, adaptation, Slow and resilience. Down. Wait, 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 wait. I know you're trying to get it done, but I have to get it. And if you have it in writing, perhaps you can just put it in there. Yeah, I'm just going to. So we really do need to. Yep. So forth in this chapter, that is the Resilient Rhode Island Act. Pertaining to climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Insofar as climate change affects the mission, duties, responsibilities, projects, or programs of the entity. That is, you all are empowered to act to protect the climate, globally and to meet these targets and we hope that you'll do so. Thank you. Who would would you like this one company to go to you or to